My friends arranged to pick me up a couple of days later. I saw them in the car as I, I was putting my car in the garage, I was pulling the shutter down, and boom, I felt a baseball bat off the side of my head. They dragged me into the car, they took me to a field in the countryside, where they shot me twice, stabbed me 18 times, broke both legs, both arms, stabbed me through the hands, the feet, fractured my skull, and basically left me to die. The most bizarre feeling in the world, really. Is I, I, I love the thrill of not knowing what's going to happen next, you know? It could be your last day on the planet. It's that, it's that the adrenaline, the anticipation of what happens next that you can't quite capture, you know? But it, I, some fighters hate the feeling, but me personally, I love it. A lot of fighters do like it. They, they, they build on it, you know? They dwell on it. That, that, that's a real part of life. I suppose it does. I mean, any kind of contact sport, really, of ice hockey, rugby, these are all dangerous sports. I'd rather box and play rugby, it looks a bit rough, you know? But I mean, it's, it's, at the end of the day, it's a contact sport. Uh, punishment's inevitable. But that's a, a it's chose occupational hazard. It can happen. I, I, I lost one of my dearest friends when I had my first pro fight on Friday, the 13th of October, 1995. One of my best friends, James Murray, died in the ring the fight after me. He was only like 24 years old. But we know what we sign up for, you know. And if, and if you ask your opponent, does he fear as well? Of, co of course he's going to say it, but we know it can happen to us or it can happen to them. That's just a fight game. If you ask my opponent, example, the next, if you know the next punch you throw is going to kill the guy, how many are you going to throw? I guarantee he tells you five. That's just that undeniable self-belief you're going to get to it. And whatever happens along the way, then so be it. You don't like it's all a show. That's rubbish. It's all fabricated nonsense. They respect, every fighter respects the other fighter. You believe in yourself wholeheartedly, 100% undeniable self-belief. Every athlete has pre-installed. It, it, it's all just part of it. It's just a gimmick to sell more tickets. And because hate will kill you faster than a bullet, you need controlled aggression. Hatred makes you do silly things and, and work too hard and put, spend too much exertion in your punches. And in the end, you will run out of gas and be run over, you know? So, hatred don't exist, you know? My grandfather, Toby Dixon was a famous boxing coach. And since the age of four, five, he used to come home from work and throw the gloves on the living room floor and we would start moving about. And I, I, I was always in the gym with my grandfather. He had the gym. I was there every day and I just came from that. I was in the blood, I guess. And, and then from there I started boxing. I, I had my first fight when I was like seven years old. I had 30 fights before I was 12. 100, another 100 fights before I was 17. Then when I turned professional, I was the youngest professional fighter in the UK ever in history. And then from there, I've had like 280 fights now in total, something like that. It's a great place to grow up, beautiful place, but it's rough, tough and nasty. Is all I remember, I come, I come, I come from the, the road, if you like, the kelp, you know, on the streets. So, I mean, I, I grew up in house in the States. And Glasgow's always been a rough, tough place, not for the faint-hearted, you know? So coming to Malta was like coming from that to Disneyland, you know? But hey, we adapted, we adjust, bit by bit, you know? But it was tough. Back in 2004, uh, I was viciously attacked, assaulted, and basically left in a field to die. Uh, the assailants who, who done it were actually three good friends of mine who uh, were paid by jealous boxing promoters to end my career because I wouldn't re-sign my contract with the promoters. So I spoke to the promoters a couple of days before and then I said to them, listen, my contract's expired. I would like to go back to London and resurrect my career down south. There was these two kind of gangster boys, i.e. boxing promoters, 
said to me, listen, if you leave us, you won't fight again. I mean, listen, I'm a sportsman, behave. But I left. Uh, my friends arranged to pick me up a couple of days later. I saw them in the car as I, I was putting my car in the garage. I was pulling the shutter down and boom, I felt a baseball bat off the side of my head. They dragged me into the car. They took me to a field in the countryside where they shot me twice, stabbed me 18 times, broke both legs, both arms, stabbed me through the hands, the feet, fractured my skull and basically left me to die. Well, I played dead in the end, you know, and they left and uh, I opened my eyes in the middle of nowhere in this field. I had no idea where I was. My bearings were totally out. And uh, I tried to stand up a few times, couldn't do so, everything was broken, kept falling over. I was just about to give up, roll over and die, when I had I heard a voice in my head. The voice said, sing. So I started to, I, at first I couldn't remember any songs. And I was really racking my brain to, to, to remember one song that can keep me afloat, if you like. The only song I can remember was the song from Sunday school, and it was one more step along the world we go. So I started to sing it loud, and the voice is saying in my head, sing loud, sing loud. I'm singing, I'm crawling. I managed to crawl to a farmhouse in the middle of nowhere. I saw the light on the window. So I got up to the window, and you can imagine, it must have been like a scene from a horror movie. The guy's lying on the sofa, sleeping, and he's kind of coming away, and I'm banging the window, blood everywhere, all over the window. And I could hear him calling his wife in, in a panic. They came out, I told them my name, I've been attacked, can you help me? They found an ambulance and managed to get to the hospital. By the grace of God, I made it through it, you know? Yeah. Obviously, the, the big blow to me was the doctor told me you'll, you'll never fight again. You know, so many injuries, I was, I was viciously stabbed in the legs, I had two bullets in the legs, ruptured all my tendons, I had a, a thing called drop foot where I couldn't raise my foot up. And I had to wear special braces and learn how to walk again. And you know, I, look, but I just had to get through those, those hard days, you know. One day at a time, you say, sweet Jesus, you know. It's like the song, like the song goes. And uh, just day by day, I improved. I, I kept that will to live, will to recover, you know, and, and, and just move forward for that shady part of my life. I think you can always be your own worst critic and say if I'd have done this right and I'd have done that, I could have projected myself to a better place. But what I, what I always did when I trained back, back in the day was I always gave 110%. That's one thing I always done, I applied myself. Because my grandfather was a very, very strict boxing coach and whatever he said went down. So I really did apply myself. It was only in my later career I started to cheat a little bit, you know, go to bed on time, maybe stay out, have a drink, smoke a cigarette. Things that people go through, you know? But you can always be your worst, own worst critic, like I said, and go back and say, if I'd have done this right, if I'd have done that right. You know, but hey, it is what it is. I don't think we should dwell on it too much. I mean, you just need to look at the wall in my gym and you'll see what I've done. So, for me, it's better to be king for a day than nobody for a lifetime. Obviously, I was world champion. I won three, three versions of a world championship. But the one that stands out in my head was actually winning the Commonwealth Championship. Commonwealth is a hard thing because you have the Commonwealth countries, the Ghana, and you, you know, some real tough, strong fighters. And uh, to win the Commonwealth title, I had to beat the world's number five. Uh, a guy from New Zealand, Sean Sullivan, he gave me one tough fight. This guy kept coming like Pac-Man, eating every punch that I was throwing. I managed to win in points by a nice margin, but then in the 11th round, he dropped me down, and it was a real Rocky Balboa fight to get to the end and become the victor, you know? So it really stands out in my mind, plus it was Showtime, Primetime Live on Sky Television, you know, so that was probably my, my greatest. Up until 1999, I had no idea who Jesus Christ was. I was training at the Peacock Gym in London, so we, we, all, we all arranged an excursion to go to New York and watch a massive fight. There were some good, bad and ugly characters there. 
there were some gangster boys, there were some fighters, there were some footballers, football hooligans, you know, like infamous kind of people, you know. And we're going to Madison Square Garden for a fight and the atmosphere is electric. I look across the street and I see a guy dressed in the image of Christ. And I'm looking at this guy and I'm going, what's he doing? He's standing and dressed as Jesus in, in the middle of the street. But it also occurred to me that nobody was looking at this guy. Nobody, only me, and he was only looking at me. And I kept looking back and looking back and his eyes were following me everywhere. From after the fourth, fifth time, I looked around, boom, he's gone. And I stopped and I'm like, what happened there? Did I just see that, Did, you know? Anyway, my friends are going to school, what's wrong with you? Have you seen a ghost? And I went, something like that. Anyway, I walked 10 yards, we continued to start walking, and I look and I see a t-shirt shop, and remember the, the Pepsi logo, Pepsi, the choice of all generations, but the Pepsi was gone and it said, Jesus. Boom, I find myself in the shop, I pay a few dollars, Take the t-shirt. Again, my friends, I said, you crazy, you losing it, Scott, what's wrong with you? Anyway, so I'm back in London a couple of weeks later, training. I'm in the famous, famous Peacock Gym in Canning Town, East London. And it was a, a, tra a trainer called Jimmy Tibbs, became a born again Christian, a pastor, an evangelist preacher. And he was watching me train. And he went, Scott, have you found Jesus? I went, Jimmy, I never knew I was supposed to be looking for him. He said, well, he found you, kid, you're wearing that T-shirt. That you going to gospel church and, you know, like church every Sunday, prayer meetings during the week. Then, in 2001, I was fighting for a world title against a guy called Takalo, a yacht called Bethnal Green. So the week before the fight was actually like 9-11, and my auntie died the day after 9-11. So it really broke me, I was broken to pieces. I'm in London, I'm alone, I'm in training camp, I've got a week to go. I don't feel like fighting. So my Uncle Jimmy comes down to see me. We go walk up Leicester Square to take my mind off things. So we're walking through Leicester Square and I see a guy standing on a box in the pouring rain. Jesus is coming, the end of the world is nigh. Repent now and you shall be saved. Nobody listening to this guy. Oh, I feel a hand on my shoulder and I feel the peace go right through my body. And I look to my left and I see the same image I've seen in New York. I've seen the Lord Jesus the same tell that image and I couldn't speak and he walked through the crowd and I'm looking so me I looked at my uncle Jimmy and he said we both looked at each other at the same time and both said in sync that was Jesus so I seen that I know what he saw as well you know and that's what the, the Bible says everybody will have a chance to know me before I come again so I, I was graced you know All right.